We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all works in your hands. You promise you won't leave us. And when we face the tests and trials, you are there. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Good morning, church friends and family. We gather today to worship our living God. He is the God who gives us life. He is the God who gives us breath. He is the God who gives us hope. Even in the midst of the uncertainty and perhaps even chaos and confusion, we are certain that God is with us. He gathers us. We gather around the table this morning, the Lord's Supper, to be reminded of the hope that we have in Jesus. Not only does he gather us, but then he sends us out. This is the rhythm and, and motion of the church that we gather to worship and to sing and to praise our living God. And then we go into the world to serve. And so as we gather and worship this morning, would you please join with me in prayer? Oh God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the reminder that you are with us, that you are Emmanuel. And Lord, we need to be reminded of that. We need to be encouraged. Uh, we need to be set free of the things that hold us back. And so Lord, as we gather and as we worship, would you just remind us that you are with us, that we are loved, that you see us, that you know us, and that you call us by name. And so, Lord, allow us now to enter into your presence and worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
things work together for my good. You make all things work together for
Morning, friends. As we continue in our worship this service this morning, I just want to remind you and let you know about a couple of things. One of those is that our good friend Doug now passed away earlier this week. Doug was a longtime member of this church. I think he ushered uh, in the sanctuary for almost 60 years or maybe more than 60 years. And so we want to send our prayers and our thoughts to the now family and, and just encourage them. And um, we're grateful for Doug's wonderful life. A couple other things just that we constantly are reminding you of. First of all, if you want to join us for a time of fellowship on our Zoom call, you can do that every Sunday morning at 940, and you just go to ljpress.org slash Zoom. We'd love to see you there this morning. Secondly, you all have been so faithful in your contributions to this church and your faithful generosity that allows us to do our mission and our ministry. And you can continue to do that. You can either give online on our website or you can mail in your check to the church. So I just want to say thank you for the ways in which you bless us so that we might be a blessing to others. And now would you pray with me? God, you um, are the God who has formed us. You are the God who has shaped us and created us. God, as we've been studying the book of Jeremiah, we are reminded of that, that God, you are the potter, and you are the one who forms, who shapes, who creates and God, we pray that we would become the people that you long for us to be, that we would not let our sin get in the way, Lord, that we would seek to serve you with everything that we have. So forgive us when we go the wrong way. We pray for our world, Lord. We pray for our nation. We pray for people who just feel out of sorts, for people who... Um, Lord, are struggling in whether that's with mental health issues, whether that's with depression. Um, God, in, in so many ways, um, our society seems to be coming up against us. So would you give us faith? Would you give us joy? Would you give us hope? God, would you be the one who sustains? Lord, for those who are ill, for those who have lost loved ones, for those who have grown weary, we pray that your spirit would descend upon them, God, that they would be encouraged by you, that they would experience, that we would experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. And Lord, for the, the vision that you've given to La Jolla Press, that not only do we experience the transforming love of Jesus, but we also express that. So Lord, help us, give us tangible ways to express your love and your grace. Help us to see those in need and be able to reach out to them, even in the midst of this COVID experience that, uh, that we are all going through. God, give us the eyes of Jesus. Give us the compassion of Jesus. Give us the hope of Jesus. For God, we do ask and we pray all these things in his holy and precious name. Amen. Good morning, friends. Today is the first day of our new Sunday School series, Let It Out, where we get to talk about our emotions. And I am so happy because our first emotion is joy. And joy is my favorite word. Is it a little weird that I said I'm happy about joy? I mean, aren't they the same thing? Well, the short answer is no. But the yummier answer is donuts. Well, kind of, stay with me. You see, in our lives, we normally get to choose what we do and what goes into them, like visiting friends, or going to a birthday party, or even going to school. But every once in a while, something happens that we didn't expect, and that can change things. That can shake things up. Because of COVID, we're going to school at home. Because of quarantining, we maybe didn't get to have our own birthday party. Let's see what happened. Huh. Do you notice something? You see, all of the chocolate donuts have been changed. They were impacted by the one thing that was around them. But look at this one. Even though there were more of the chocolate donuts, they didn't affect this one at all. This is the difference between happiness and joy. 
Our happiness can be impacted and changed by what's going on around us. It can even be taken away. But our joy comes from Jesus. And Jesus never changes. And what's kind of fun is that we can sprinkle a little bit of Jesus's joy everywhere we go. Will you pray with me? Dear God, you have been the same loving father since the beginning of time. We thank you for sending Jesus to be our salvation and our deep joy that never changes. God, would you help us to cling to this joy even when things around us in our world are changing? And would you help us to spread a little bit of it to their friends around us? We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, I hope that you have a joyful week. So before we get started with my sermon this morning, the first thing I want to do is say thank you. Uh, not only do we talk to you about giving financially to the church, we also allow you to have different opportunities to bring in items or to help serve our mission partners. And a week ago, we talked about the need for Gatorade for our homeless community. And you all were amazing. 74 plus cases of Gatorade that got dropped off last Monday morning. It was great to be out there. I got to see some of you and others of you I know got to connect. And it was so good uh, to be in community. Some of you are wondering, what do you do with 74 cases of Gatorade? We're actually going to be giving some of that to our church partner, Ebenezer Church, down in Linda Vista, who have their own ministry to the homeless. And so it's a great way not only that you have blessed the homeless community here in La Jolla, but also the homeless community in Linda Vista. And I want to let you know about another mission opportunity that you will have. On Saturday, August 8th, next Saturday, we're going to be having a, what we're calling a drive-through on Draper. A number of our mission partners have given us an idea of how we can help them, of ways in which you can bring items by the church that the, then we will get to them. And so if you go to ljpress.org slash mission, um, you will see what we need. It's, there's there's a, a nice list there. I'm not going to go through all those items this morning, but just go to ljpress.org slash mission. It'll give you all the information that you need. It's going to be happening Saturday from 10 to 12, and we're just asking you to drive right through on Draper, right in front of the church, and there'll be people there to come out and take your items. You don't have to get out of the car. You don't have to do anything. Just drive down Draper and join us for that next Saturday, August 8th. We'd love to see you. So some of you may be familiar with a street sign that looks like this. We, we don't see them very often in the United States, but we know what it means is there's a speed bump coming up ahead. Now, I have to admit, this sign you see a lot when you go to Belize. One of the bummers of this COVID experience has been that we did not get to take our annual mission trip down to Belize this summer, uh, which is really a it's hard for me. I've been going to Belize since 1999. This is the first summer that I've missed since then. And, and it's just hard not to be down there and to be with our friends. But as one who has gone so many times, I know what speed bumps look like. And I'm w very familiar with them in Belize. Now, Belize basically has three what people would call highways throughout the country. There's a northern highway that runs from Mexico down to Belize City. There's the Western Highway, which goes out from Belize City towards Guatemala, which is the, the road that we take when we do our mission projects. And there's a Southern Highway called the Hummingbird Highway that goes down to Southern Belize. Now, these are not highways that you and I might think of here in the United States. They're paved and they're two lanes and that's it. And in the country of Belize, I, I don't know that there's very many traffic signals. There's certainly not traffic signals on these roads. And I'm pretty convinced that in Belize, they use speed bumps as traffic signals. It's the way in which they slow down traffic. And as you're coming into a city or a community, as there's a crosswalk, you'll see these signs that warn you that there's a speed bump coming. But there is a problem. Sometimes when I've been driving in Belize, I don't know if I haven't seen the sign or perhaps there wasn't a sign. And so when you hit one of these speed bumps going 40 or 50 miles an hour, you really hope that you're driving 
and not sitting in the back of the van. Now, I've experienced both of these. And I'll tell you, when you're driving, you hit that speed bump, and you're, it, it, it's not that comfortable, but it's fine. You don't really notice it. But when you're sitting in the back of a van and you hit that, your head kind of does this, and it goes sideways, and it goes right up to the very top of the van, van, and you feel it. You know that you have hit a speed bump. Well, the speed bumps are there. Those signs, the speed bump signs are there to serve as a sort of warning. And this summer, we've been looking at the words of Jeremiah, who has been warning the nation of Judah that God is going to carry them into exile. He's been warning them they need to get their act together. They need to start worshiping the living God instead of all of these false idols. But as we know what happens, they don't listen. And in our text we're going to read in just a moment, they are led in to exile. Now, sometimes exile happens because we don't listen. We're not paying attention. But sometimes exile just happens regardless of anything that we have done, regardless of anything that we have said. Because exile basically, as I think about it, it means that we're someplace that we really don't want to be. And many of us today, and for the past several months, have even perhaps been feeling a little bit of this sense of exile, that we're not really at home. Even though we are at home, because we're stuck at home, we don't feel as though it quite fits. It's interesting that even before the days of COVID, the church often looked at the text we're going to look at in just a minute and talked about how the church itself is in exile, how we are in the midst of a culture and a society that, that, that doesn't get us, that we talk about how are we faithful? How, how do we share this faith that we have in Jesus with the world that's around us? And the church lamented that we were in exile. And so I want us to do this morning, today and next Sunday, we're going to look at Jeremiah 29, this letter to the exiles, and consider what is it that Jeremiah might have to say to us. So this morning, we're going to start that in Jeremiah chapter 29, and we're going to read the first nine verses, and then uh, the next Sunday, we'll take a look down to verse 14. But today, Jeremiah 29, verse 1. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiachin and the queen mother, the court officials, and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and to Gamariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Here is what it said. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. So here's what's happening. It's now around 597 B.C. And Babylon has come in and they have captured the city of Jerusalem. They have not quite taken over the entire nation of Judah. The full-on Babylonian captivity and Babylonian exile doesn't really happen until 587 BC. So this is 10 years earlier. But what they did, 
And what the Babylonians did, particularly with people who, who fought against them in, in extreme ways, they would take their essential leaders and remove them from cities. And so you read about that in Jeremiah, that they take the artisans, they take the leaders, they take the families of the prophets and the priests, and they exile them to Babylon. They take them captive. That's what we call it, the Babylonian captivity. And so they are escorted out of the city and you have these, prof, these families of prophets, these families of priests, these, these people who had wisdom, and they're all taken away from the city of Jerusalem. And it is to those people that Jeremiah writes. Now, what's interesting historically here is to realize that one of those families that was led away was the family of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the prophet we read about right after Jeremiah, was actually from a priestly family. And so as Jeremiah writes this letter, part of what it is to be said and a part of who it is to be spoken to is going to be to the family of Ezekiel. And as we know what happens later, God calls Ezekiel to be a prophet. He is not only from the priestly family, but he is also a prophet. And if you know anything about Ezekiel, he looks back. He looks back to Jerusalem. He looks back to the temple because he came out of this priestly family. And he talks about this idea of longing for Jerusalem, of longing for the temple. But then he says, but that's not going to happen because instead what God is going to do is something new. Ezekiel 37, you may recall this, the valley of dry bones. God takes Ezekiel out and gives him this vision of all of these bones. And he says, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And then God prophesied, God brings his word, God brings his spirit, and the bones begin to come together. There is life. And God gives Ezekiel this vision that points us ultimately to Jesus, but he's saying, I am going to do something new, not just for the nation of Israel, not just for Judah, but for the whole world. Now, some of you I know are concerned because you're thinking, great, Paul's just in the midst of preaching through Jeremiah. Paul, please don't go on to Ezekiel. We really cannot handle two prophets in one year. And I promise we're not going to look at Ezekiel. But I just want you to see the context of that. Because sometimes I'm not sure when we read through scripture that we put all of these stories together. We put all of these people together. That Jeremiah was certainly older than Ezekiel, but they were contemporaries. They were doing the same things that even as Jeremiah is writing, Ezekiel's beginning, I mean, not at this point, but very soon, will have his call to be a priest. So what happens? Well, Jeremiah sends a letter with a couple of envoys, these guys named Elisa and Gemariah, who serve as envoys of the king. And they go from Jerusalem to Babylon to deliver a message to Nebuchadnezzar. But before they do that, they go to those who have been exiled, including Ezekiel's family, and they have a message for them. Now, later in Jeremiah, we read that at this point, there were probably about 3,000 people who had been carried away from Jerusalem. But they carry this message that runs counter to what the prophets were proclaiming to the people who were in Babylon. And we've talked about this before, that Jeremiah was constantly in, in, in fr constantly had friction with the other prophets of Judah because they were not speaking God's word. And what's happening in the text, and if you continue to read through Jeremiah 29, through all of it, there's conversations that go back and forth. But these prophets, these false prophets were saying, hey, people of Judah, don't mess with these people from Babylon. This is all going to end soon. You're going to get to go back home soon. You're going to get to go back to Jerusalem soon. You're going to get to go back to Judah soon. So just, just don't worry about it. Don't acclimate with them. Don't talk to them. Don't mess with them. And if you know the story of Jeremiah, you know that is not the case. Because Jeremiah knows that for 70 years, for an entire generation, the people of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, will be in exile. They'll be in Babylon. And so what does Jeremiah says, say? Jeremiah says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to settle down. 
I want you to build some houses. I want you to get used to the seasons that come your way when you're living in Babylon. I want you to basically, which is crazy to say, forget about Jerusalem because you are not going back anytime soon. I want you to settle down. I want you to settle in Babylon. And those false prophets are saying, absolutely not. And so Jeremiah writes this letter to say, you need to make your home there. You need to settle. Now, let's be honest. And I've talked about this and I've preached about this before. No one wants to settle. We don't want to just simply settle in some place that we really don't want to be. We don't want to settle when we are in exile. And yet God is saying, look, I have brought you here for a reason. Not only did you disobey me, which was the main reason why, but even in the midst of that, we're going to talk more about this next week. God says, I have you here for a purpose. You need to settle in. I have scattered you for a reason. You are away from home. You are away from the temple. I have moved you out on the roads of life and you have a purpose. And I think this is a hard lesson for the church. I think it's a hard lesson probably for many of us. This idea that God scatters. There's a great article in the New York Times a couple weeks ago that someone sent to me and is a, a Lutheran uh, priest or pastor who, who had written the article. And she was talking about the importance of communion. She was talking about the importance of bread. She was talking about how the church is so used to gathering around the table, and particularly for other denominations like Lutherans and Episcopalians and Catholics, so much of their liturgy is built just specifically around the table, around the Lord's Supper. And she was talking about how that's been taken away from us with COVID. That this idea of communing, of being together, has been taken away because of coronavirus. But what I found interesting was this. She kept writing. And, and, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase it. But she said, has the church forgotten that not only does God gather around a table, but God also scatters? And if you think about this, you remember Jesus? He, he calls these disciples. He gathers the 12. He gathers the 72. And then what does he say? get out of here. Go on, go. Take nothing with you. Let people welcome you or not welcome you. Go out and heal people. Cure their diseases. Pray for them. Sometimes Jesus sends them out two by two. Sometimes it looks like he sends them out all by themselves. He scatters the disciples. He scatters the followers. If you go back to the early days of the church in Ireland, the, the Celtic church revival that happened, they had this great term called the peregrinati. I wrote about this in my thesis. And it was this idea of the walkabout, that as soon as a church got to a certain size, which was usually like 20 or 30 people, maybe 40, there would be certain people who would be sent out. They would be scattered. They'd be told to go out on the road. They didn't even know where they were going. But it was out on the road where mission happened. And to me, this has been a really important reminder because I think we get caught up a lot of times in saying we have to be in worship. We have to be together. We have to commune together. And certainly we need to. I, I get that. I have missed being able to do that over these past four and a half or five months. But I think about how the church grew. It never grew by simply being still and gathering in worship. It grew because people gathered and then were scattered. And what I want to suggest and what I want to encourage us to think about is, is what are we doing? How are we, how are we living this out? We can't gather right now, but we certainly have been scattered. And if you think about how the gospel message got carried out, it was because disciples and believers were scattered. They were exiled. They had to live in places where they did not want to live. And so... Let's think about that. Let's think about the, the gift that has actually been given to us. We don't think of it this way because we can't gather in person, but perhaps it actually is a gift of God saying, open your eyes. Who do you see? Who do you know? 
that you might not see otherwise. So that's the first thing. The second thing that Jeremiah says to the people of Judah who are now exiled in Babylon, he says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city and pray for it. That word for peace and prosperity that gets translated peace and prosperity is actually the word shalom, wholeness, completeness. Jeremiah says, wherever you are, you need to work for the flourishing of your community, for the peace and the prosperity. You need to look around and see where you can bring beauty where you can bring love, where you can bring encouragement. You need to seek the peace and prosperity of the city and you need to pray for it. And I don't know about you, but I find that to be a very challenging word because those people who he was writing to, they were not living the life of comfort I mean, oftentimes when we get to Jeremiah 29, 11, which we'll look at next week over here, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. When we get to that, we think that's wonderful. That's great. But we don't always remember those words were spoken while Judah was in exile. It's a future plan. And God says, in the meantime, you are to pray for the shalom of the city. You are to act for the shalom of the city. In the midst of your discomfort, you are to seek to love your neighbor. And that, my friends, is gospel. You think about Jesus. He left the comfort of heaven in order to live amongst us. We even read in scripture, the son of man had no place to lay his head. Even the animals have a place to lay their head. But Jesus had no place. But he came and lived amongst us in order to die so that we might live. In in order to be uncomfortable so that we might be comforted. And so if we are feeling like we're really not where we want to be, I agree. We miss some of the things that we used to get to do. Travel, seeing family, going out, eating indoors, being in worship. We miss some stuff. We, I think it'd be strange for us not to have a sense of feeling exiled because we're at a place that we really don't want to be. But the problem is this, and I see this in my own life. What COVID has done for me at times, or done to me at times, is it's left me kind of paralyzed. I move and then I'm not sure I should move that way. Or we talk about the direction of the church. I'm like, I'm not really sure we should go in that direction. Or we want to do this, but then this happens. And in my mind, it's like... I I don't know what to do. I feel paralyzed. But Jeremiah gives us some good advice. He says, seek the prosperity. Seek the shalom of the city. Pray for it. Settle down where you are. It's okay. This is not the end. God's still at work. Let's not focus so much on what we've lost, but focus on what we still have. And we've lost some. Let's be honest about that but let's not spend as much time looking at what we've lost. Instead, let's look at what we have. This table, this bread, this cup, it reminds us of that. It reminds us that we're not alone. It reminds us that Jesus is with us. That he will not abandon us. That's what Jeremiah keeps saying. Even in the midst of uncertainty, remember that God is with us. Pray with me, please. Oh God, thanks for this day. Thanks for worship. Um, Thanks for the chance to be reminded that, that we're not alone in feeling exiled. And Lord, that we don't actually have to go some other place to feel exiled. The exile basically says we're someplace we don't want to be. 
But that doesn't have the last word. For God, you always have the last word. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so, Lord, would you, would you give us a little sense of hope? Inspire us some, Lord. Remind us that you are with us. God, we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, we read this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. To God's elect, exiles scattered. We look at that text uh, last fall, and, and we're just looking at, at Peter's writing to these people who are God's elect, God's chosen, who are exiles, who are scattered. But in that scattering, you know what they did? They kept telling the story of Jesus. And so this morning, as we gather, we remind ourselves at this table that God feeds us, God restores us, God renews us. And so we remember the words of institution, that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks to God in heaven, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this, my body, broken for you. In the same manner, after dinner, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. My friends, let us now participate and partake in the Lord's Supper.
Friends, we have been fed at this table, and now we gather and we affirm our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now receive our Lord's blessing as we go into this world. We have gathered and now we are scattered to go and share the good news and the hope of Jesus Christ. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God the Father, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forevermore. Amen.